This is a production of Cornell University. Um, up here, I have two samples of wheat seeds, and they're very similar. They come from the same type of crops, average, the one that we get is no wheat. That may not sound like a lot, but when you consider that wheat is grown on more acres worldwide than any other crop, and that that increase in kernel weight translates to an increase in kernel weight, that has the potential to change um, final yield and um, affect and how we manage our agricultural acres worldwide. Uh, today I'm going to speak to you about how in the Sorrels Lab we're looking to identify regions of the wheat genome that implement are, are implemented in affecting kernel weight and size um, and their potential for being introduced into elite varieties. So cereal crop yields can simply be modeled as the spikes per area by the kernels per spike and by the weight per kernel. And considering the economic importance of yield, there have been countless genetic associations looking into these different yield components. But there's been less success in actually identifying the causal variants and implementing them in elite varieties. Part of that is due to the fact that the wheat genome is very large and hexaploid, and also that yield itself is a quantitative trait. It's controlled by many small effect variants across the genome, and um, even these three simplifications illustrated here are quantitative traits themselves that are often negatively correlated. Considering this, it's important when we're studying yield to break it down into its individual components. Looking specifically at kernel weight and kernel morphology, this is largely controlled by the grain filling characteristics, such as how long a variety of wheat is photosynthetically active in the field, as well as the physical parameters of the kernels themselves, such as their length and their width, and those are both under independent genetic control. Um, when we're developing a new wheat variety, the kernel weight and shape are important traits to consider because they both can impact, like I mentioned, final yield, but also flower yield, which is um, both going to be bottom economic lines for a grower and a mill in selecting variety. Returning though to the more um, elusive characterization of the genes that um, underlie these traits, the wheat community has recently had some, the release of new tools that are going to allow us to go beyond QTL associations and actually pursue fine mapping and cloning of those traits. Those include the release of a fully annotated wheat reference sequence genome, as well as the prospects of gene editing and tools like CRISPR, we can pursue the um, fine mapping and positional cloning of yield components. The Wheat Cap, or Coordinated Agricultural Project, aims to do just this. It's a concerted effort across 15 land-grant universities to identify genes that control different yield components and then implement them into wheat breeding programs. Cornell is a part of this effort, and specifically in the Soros Lab, we're looking to identify genes that impact kernel weight and kernel shape. To do this, we're using a biparental population across between the spring wheat varieties, W7984, um, or synthetic W7984, and Opata M85, and those have formed mapping reference populations. We have access to double haploids, as well as a large population of recombinant inbred lines. And previous work in the Sorrels lab indicated to us that there were grain morphology traits on the group five chromosomes, but our challenge now is to zoom in on those and identify um, the positional, um, the gene architecture and physical positions of causal variants. To do this, we have a two-pronged approach. We can first validate the QTL across environments and locations and years um, using the double haploids, <laughs> and then we can gain finer resolution and pursue fine mapping by using heterogeneous inbred families. These are essentially mere isogenic lines that differ at the QTL, we developed them from selecting recombinant inbred lines that we're segregating for the QTL or our regions of interest, and then have continuously inbred them. So they're largely fixed across the genome, but um, have either parentals allele at the QTL as a control for our purposes, or they're segregating, which will allow us to identify key recombination events that are associated with our positive trait of interest. Um, all of these plants are field grown. We've been working with the double haploids and the HIFs in the field since 2016, and they're planted in head rows for the double haploids, but um, we have to plant the HIFs as individual space planted rows because um, they're segregating again, and we tag them individually, as you can see here, um, so we can keep track of them for all of our phenotyping and genotyping purposes. 
um, the genotyping, this is a largely, um, or the synthetic apata population is widely used in the wheat breeding community, so we have access to a lot of public resources for genotyping. I specifically have been developing CAS markers, which are a fluorescent stent marker for targeting um, more specific um, regions associated with our QTL. The genotyping, which is cut off here, um, is all done post-harvest, and we um, harvest all the plants individually and take a representative 100 kernel sample, which is um, a proxy for 1,000 kernel weight, and then we also take that same sample and scan it on a flatbed scanner and take the kernel um, width and length parameters, which is what you can't see written right there. Um, and then all of our phenotype and genotype correlations I've been using are QTL. At this point, we've identified QTL on chromosomes 2D, 5A, 5B, and 6D that are significantly associated with 1,000 kernel weight and or the width and the length but I wanna draw your attention to chromosome 5A. Um, there is a 140 megabase pair stretch on the long arm that is significantly associated with 1,000 kernel weight and kernel width. Um, this region is more highly annotated than what I'm showing you here, but for today's purposes, I just wanna mention that it is fully fixed across the double haploids. We either have the um, opata or the synthetic alleles for all of these um, um, markers but within the HIFs, it's segregating, and that's going to allow us to pursue the further fine mapping. Our QTL then provides us with a LOD score, or logarithm of odds, which is a measurement of significance between a genetic marker and a physical trait that we've measured. Here in dark blue, we have the, um, across this 140 megabase pair region, the um, LOD score significance values 4,000 kernel weight, and in light blue, that's going to be for the width measurements. And consistently, we break our threshold significance level of three. Now I wanna show you the um, parental associations for these alleles and which parent's allele is the positive donor for these traits. We can do that by breaking the double haploid population into two groups based on whether they carry the synthetic allele or the apata allele across the 140 megabase pair region. And looking specifically here at the 1,000 kernel weight distribution, 1,000 kernel weight is on the x-axis, and we've broken the population into two groups with opata alleles across the locus in pink or blue, um, synthetic in blue. And on average, we see a 4.4% increase in 1,000 kernel weight for double haploid lines that carry the opata allele rather than the synthetic. And we see a similar story when we look at the width distributions. Here, width is on the x-axis. And again, there's a 3.75% increase in kernel width associated with double haploid lines that carry the opata allele rather than the synthetic at our locus. I mentioned previously that um, the kernel length can also independently impact kernel weight. Um, and so here we see at our locus, there's little to no difference in kernel length um, for whether a double haploid plant carries either parent's allele which indicates to us we're pursuing a gene in this region that controls 1,000 kernel weight, most likely due to an increase in kernel width. Our ultimate goal is to be introducing these genes into varieties um, that farmers like to grow. We're doing this simultaneously by backcrossing um, the genes as we continue to find map them into elite varieties grown by domestic farmers, as well as through the Wheat Caps collaboration with Cement. And we'll continue to pursue um, the identification of candidate genes and then further um, identify and validate the gene architecture through mutant populations and then potentially gene editing if that suits our purposes. A challenge that I mentioned is that the double haploid population has limited resolution. But if we return to our methodologies and strategies, um, I can develop cast primers that target recombination events at our QTL taking place in the segregating HIF population. Over 200 HIF plants were harvested from the field this summer and they've been genotyped um, and I'm in the process of phenotyping those and those correlations will lay a strong foundation for the continuous fine mapping of these traits and um, our field plantings this summer. With that, I'd like to say thank you to the many advisors that I have on this research and would be happy to answer any questions. Question for Ellie. 
Um, for the distributions of the uh, kernel width, it appeared like, I think that's what it was. You, you appear to have this bimodal yeah. thing going on. Do you, do you have an explanation for that? Is there another gene segregating for some reason or? There may be. Um, I've noticed it as well. When we work with this population in the field, it's really diverse. There's a lot of different phenotypes and I'm sure there is something that we aren't catching. I also mentioned just how complex yield is and there's many different traits affecting it. As we grow fewer plants that we're more confident in the region of the gene, I hope that we can take further phenotypes that might account for some of those effects. Yeah. But I'm not sure what trait is causing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, um, let's give Ellie another round of applause. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.